Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marisa Ramirez, and we, uh, Nancy and I want to thank um, Pamela, Cindy, and all the folks at Alex for um, giving Nancy and I the opportunity to share with you today. Um, let me see if by the uh, end of the hour today, we hope you'll be able to identify sources for collecting, enhancing, and redistributing siloed metadata. Uh, by the end of the hour today, you'll also be able to describe uh, strategies to collect and reuse descriptive metadata. And you'll also be able to identify tools that are available for use um, in metadata transformation. So let's start by talking about metadata. Uh, metadata is essential for organizing and providing greater access to information resources. And this is particularly true as libraries make their collections increasingly available on the web. So uh, for the purposes of today's discussion, uh, we've adopted NISO's definition of metadata as structured information that describes, explains, locates, or otherwise makes it easier to retrieve, use, or manage an information resource. Metadata is critical, as we all know, to providing access to the wide variety of resources that are populating institutional repositories. Um, the information could vary from peer-reviewed uh, journal content to grade literature like PowerPoint presentations or working papers, student research uh, such as theses or honors papers, as well as other scholarship and creative outputs. And ideally, the descriptive metadata that's created for these resources is good and shareable as outlined by NISO and Sarah Shreves and her co-authors. Um, let's just go over a few of the aspects of good and shareable metadata. Um, good and shareable metadata conform to a set of standards. It uses authority control, and it's of high quality and reflects consistent application and practice. For digital objects, good and shareable metadata includes rights um, or terms of use. Uh, Good and shareable metadata is coherent, meaning that um, the metadata makes sense at a glance. There's no packing of multiple values into a single element. Um, and it also provides context, meaning uh, if the metadata is removed from its local environment, you can still make sense of it. Uh, good and shareable metadata, metadata supports long-term preservation, is authoritative, authentic, archivable, persistent, and unique. And ideally, it's optimized for interoperability. So let's suppose that we had an institutional repository that had metadata embodying all the attributes I just mentioned. Um, the metadata may be of the utmost quality, um, but we may still be in a situation where the metadata is stored in a closed system, siloed away from other systems, and without any automated or built-in mechanisms for sharing this data. This could mean, in effect, that uh, parallel or duplicative metadata creation practices could be taking place in more than one system on campus, um, which is not only an inefficient use of time and energy, but it also increases the chances for inconsistent description across systems. So um, since we're talking about metadata silos, we're going to pause here and ask you to respond to a poll about metadata at your own institution. And I've just launched the poll, so you should be seeing a poll. Um, the question is, what descriptive metadata silos exist at your institution? And what we're going to ask you to do is respond. You can select all the options that, that apply to your institution. Perhaps you have a silo, uh, the integrate, the ILS, or the institution repository. Perhaps you have digitized archival collections, campus systems, or other homegrown systems on campus where metadata is stored. We'll pause for a moment. We'll let you answer this, and then we'll get back in a moment. Okay, so in a moment I'm going to close the poll. Okay, the poll is closed. And let's take a look at the results. 
So it looks like the majority of um, you have metadata in your ILS. Well, that's to be expected. Um, followed by an institution repository and archival collections. Um, but a lot of you, 67%, also have homegrown or other systems on campus that um, contain metadata. I think the point of this poll is to um, kind of point out the challenge for many of us is to bridge these silo walls, um, to further reach, um, to further the reach of our metadata for use and reuse. So um, the rest of this presentation will focus on how to bridge those silos walls and how to use um, specific methods to do so. The first thing that Nancy and I would recommend is to, um, we propose that you change how you approach, think, and talk about these closed systems and their relationship to the institutional repository. What we recommend is instead of talking about silos, we recommend that you start talking about them as sources for metadata. So talk about them as sources rather than silos. Potential sources we've already seen, the ILS could be a potential source for metadata. Uh, campus systems like Blackboard or the human resources database on campus. Those systems might have metadata that you can use and reuse. Digitized archival collections uh, also seem to be a popular uh, place where you can um, use that metadata. Um, it's, it, perhaps you have a legacy database or perhaps you're using content DM and you want to get that information out and into your repository. You may maintain local information in a database or spreadsheet um, in a homegrown way, and it would be useful to ingest that content into, into an institutional repository. And of course, there are other sources uh, that you have. We'd be interested in hearing what those other sources are. Um, an example here at Cal Poly is we have XML finding aids. Um, there are a lot of rich uh, descriptive information in our finding aids, and it would be wonderful if we could reuse that metadata um, for other purposes. So speaking of Cal Poly, we have several potential sources of metadata we'd like to mine um, and reuse in our IR. So I thought I'd provide a few examples. Um, we have information we'd like to port over from our ILS and get it into IR. Uh, many faculty have uh, published content that's already been cataloged in the ILS. So ideally, we would be able to pull the authority record in the ILS, move it into the IR. It would save us keystrokes, um, but it would also maintain consistency between the two systems. We also have metadata in our repository that ideally we could port over to the ILS. Uh, we have an electronic submission process in place for master's theses and senior capstone projects. So during the upload process to the repository, uh, the student supplies metadata about their project. So they create a record, they upload it, and then that record is reviewed by a library coordinator for misspellings and other information. And then that coordinator turns around and creates a simple entry in the ILS. Later, then the catalogers augment that simple ILS entry with additional information like abstracts, subject, subject descriptors. Um, what we've heard is that the catalogers say it would be really great if we could reuse that data without having to rekey the information. And that would be ideal. That would cut out some of the redundant metadata, redundant metadata processes that we're already seeing. Luckily, we've had some success in porting over existing metadata into our IR. Uh, an example is uh, we've used uh, uh, we have a collection of photographs, basically a legacy collection. And much of the valuable description about this legacy collection of photographs exists in an Excel spreadsheet. So the goal was to reuse instead of recreate the data. We were also able to export data from a homegrown database and import that information into our repository. Um, there was a department unit on campus that had a rich collection of uh, campus maps and historic building plans, and our architecture students used this database quite frequently for their assignments. Um, they, unfortunately, they would have to go to one specific computer to do that. Um, and so being able to put these campus maps and plans into a repository was certainly a boon for them because they could do work from home. Um, 
we were able to utilize uh, the rich array of information that was in that homegrown database. Uh, for example, architect, contractor, construction cost, um, architectural style, all this information we could reuse. Um, we were able to find a workaround. We were able to ingest that information into our repository, saving us keystrokes. Uh, having the ability to share descriptive uh, data across systems uh, like we've said, would enhance and create efficiencies in our work that's currently being done. Um, and even if the metadata that you're starting with is not a complete record, um, at least you have some data to work with instead of starting from zero. So again, we encourage you to think about these systems as sources rather than silos. So the next question then becomes, well, how do we get the metadata from these sources into the IR? and vice versa. Well, the options are either, well, you know, you have an interoperable system. Uh, the other option is finding workarounds. Um, interoperability would be ideal. Uh, having seamless integration between the various systems would be fantastic, uh, but it's often not realistic. So if interoperability between systems is not feasible, the other option is extracting metadata from the various sources, um, transforming that data to fit the various requirements for its destination, uh, possibly into your IR, and then ingesting it into the system. So Nancy, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Nancy, and she's going to talk about strategies for collecting and redistributing siloed metadata. Okay. Um, I think... Hold on one sec. Okay. So thanks, Marissa. I'm sorry about that, guys. Um, so as Marissa said, ideally, we'd love to have all our systems seamlessly sharing data. But for most of us, that's just not our reality. Um, if you have useful metadata in systems that don't communicate, as Marissa discussed, you still may be able to work around those silos by finding a way to extract or, or export the metadata you want to use. So this next portion of the webinar is going to focus on the process of extracting siloed metadata and reusing it in your institutional repository. I'll start with the need to have a metadata plan or guidelines, both for your repository and also for each particular digitization project you may undertake. Then um, I'll talk about some ways to extract existing metadata from their silos. And I'll be speaking mostly from my experience. And then I'll finish talking about, by talking about how you can modify the metadata that you've extracted or exported and modify it with XSLT so that it meets um, both your repository and your project guidelines, the things that we initially put in place in the metadata planning um, section. So let's start with your metadata planning. Before you can know whether or not there is pre-existing metadata out there somewhere that you may want to or can use in your repository, you need to know what metadata you want and you need in your repository. You start by creating um, metadata guidelines or a metadata guidelines document that defines and justifies the metadata that you want to have. Be sure to document why you want or why you made some choice so that others um, who may come after you, if you retire or you leave, will not have to reinvent the wheel and try to figure out why you made the decisions that you made. When you're creating your guidelines, you should be thinking about um, the schema, the metadata elements, and the metadata values that you want. So for example, do you have a preferred schema? Um, would you prefer to use mods because of its richness? Or would you prefer just to have something really simple and use data, um, Dublin Core? Uh, what specific elements do you want and why do you want them? And how do you define those elements? So for example, should all contributors be considered authors or creators? Um, do you want to specify contributor roles? And um, if so, should those role designations perhaps be mandatory or optional? You may conclude that while you want certain data, it's not always available, so it has to be optional. For example, you may really want to have role information for your contributors, but you have to acknowledge that sometimes that data just isn't there. When it's there, great, you'll take it. And if it's not there, well, then okay, it's optional. 
And then you also need to think about how you might want your metadata formatted. So an example here is do you want your dates um, input as year, month, day or month, day, year? Do you want um, four digits in your year or two digits in your year? Um, little things, but um, there are things that you know down the line will become important. As you're creating your guidelines, some other things that you might want to consider um, are whether or not you need different information for different formats. So do you need to have different um, um, required or optional information for, let's say, videos versus books? Um, is there something that you need for, that you think should be required for videos or that you want to, um, to at least suggest to people who, who are inputting videos that you really don't think is necessary at all for, for some other format? You may also want to consider how knowledgeable your audience is. Uh, do you want, if, if your audience is comprised solely of scientists, well then you may want some more specific and some more technical metadata um, than you would want if your audience was a mix, say, of undergrads and professors or the general public. You may also want to think about whether or not you need to have elements for in-house management of your digital resources. Do you need, for example, to have some kind of a collection code in your metadata so that you can, um, you can relate what's in your repository to something, uh, an exhibition? or to, to some, some other um, internal um, database or to your ILS. Um, and then, you know, do you need to do something specific to share the metadata that you're putting in? Um, you know, ideally, as we said, we, you know, we, we want to think about interoperability. So try to think ahead and into the future as you're creating these guidelines. What might you be able to put into your metadata now that you could use in the future so that it would allow your ILS, your, your um, institutional repository metadata to talk to metadata outside, to, to systems outside your institutional repository. So those are your ideals. That, that's, that's, you know, your, your pie in the sky, this is what we'd love to have. Um, but now that you've created, you know, your ideal repository guidelines, it's time for a little reality check. Um, you need to be prepared to temper your ideals to meet your system requirements or your user interface requirements. Um, your repository and your user interface may place limitations on the metadata that you can actually use in your repository. So, for example, um, you may want to use mods because it's rich metadata. And I was in a situation at one time where I had a, um, a sponsor who wanted to use mods, um, but the repository was not set up for that rich metadata. It was set up with a very simple user interface and a very simple metadata scheme to use Dublin Core. Um, so you discover your user interface will only process simple Dublin Core. You want mods. Um, it's okay. Um, it, it just means that you have to be flexible. Um, flexible with your guidelines, maybe you modify them temporarily. Um, you can still say, yes, we'd love to have this, but you know, your requirements will now be different because your requirements need to meet what your system um, will take. Um, it doesn't mean that you, for, instance, for example, throw away that mods that, that you want to use. If you've got that mods created and you, you want that mods, then, then hold on to it. Store it in your repository and hopefully someday you'll have a repository that um, will be able to use all that rich metadata. So creating these guidelines will obviously take some time and some thought. Um, but having them will serve to help both contributors to your, repository, to your repository so that they'll understand in advance the metadata that they need to provide to you. And um, it will help you if you're going to map pre-existing metadata to use in your repository. The idea and what's important and has always been important to me is to just be flexible. Nothing is set in stone. Um, be prepared to make adjustments to fit what you, what you get and, and what you have to what you need. When you have a digital project, um, so let's say you're digitizing historical maps or theses and dissertations, you need to do some research to find out what, if any, metadata may already exist for these objects. 
uh, maybe you'll find that there's a spreadsheet with descriptive metadata about a photo collection, as Marissa described at, at Cal Poly, or a database with dissertation information in it, or maybe there are marked bibliographic records in your ILS that you can use. You need to um, compare the pre-existing metadata that you find with the metadata that you want or need for digital objects in your repository. Has the metadata that you want or need been recorded already, either in whole or in part, in another system? So perhaps you can get a portion of what you need from a spreadsheet, but you may need to add some metadata to it. Well, at least you've got to start with that, with that partial metadata. So if that metadata, if the metadata that you want or need um, doesn't exist elsewhere, then you may need to create your metadata from scratch. Um, and, and we're not going to talk about that today. Um, if there is some pre-existing metadata, then you want to extract or export that metadata and use it in your repository. It'll save you time and it'll save you ultimately resources. And again, if only some of the metadata you need exists elsewhere, then you may want to take kind of a hybrid approach where you extract the metadata and then you augment it. Once you've assessed the pre-existing metadata, you need to map or crosswalk it to your repository metadata guidelines. This crosswalk will match up the existing metadata with the metadata scheme, the elements, and the data formats that you've determined should be the standards for your repository. It will help determine what changes you need to make in order to be able to use the pre-existing metadata and make it fit into your repository. So you found your pre-existing metadata in some other system and you've determined that it at least partially meets your repository metadata needs and you want to reuse it. So now what do you do? Well, this is when you have to do some creative thinking and exploration, frankly, of, of the tools that you may have at hand or tools that you can get. Um, the goal is to extract the metadata from its source system and output it from that source system as, as some any flavor of XML. So if you're looking at cataloging records in an ILS, um, you can use C3950. You can um, export records at Mark 20, in, as Mark 21 uh, in Mark 21 format and then um, translate them to Mark XML. If there's something that you find on the internet, you may be very lucky and find that there is an XML file or there is some file that you can extract, download, and change into XML. If you're looking, um, if your, your metadata is coming from a, a database or a spreadsheet source, um, you can translate tab delimited files to XML, or you may be able to export the data from your database as XML and then just transform it into the kind of XML, the flavor of XML that you want to use in your repository. Um, the following slides are going to offer some examples of extracting metadata and getting it into XML. These, ex this, this, um, these examples are by no means exhaustive. It's just a sample of some processes that I'm aware of and have had some success with. Um, my hope is that you'll find these useful examples and that it will inspire you to look around and try to find ways to do things in your um, institution. So extracting metadata from an ILS. Uh, Mark bibliographic records that are stored in an ILS are a really great source of metadata if they are available. Mark records are really rich resources of authoritative metadata and they should be pretty easy to extract with Z3950 client. Um, I happen to like um, Mark Edit's Z3950 client. It's embedded in Terry Reese's Mark Edit program where he supplied a very nice user-friendly interface as you can see here in this screenshot. The screenshot shows a search using the MarkEdit at C3950 client. If you follow the red arrows, you can see that um, in this screenshot, I'm searching the Library of Congress database for the title, The Cat in the Hat. Um, the search down toward the bottom, it, it found 49 records. And um, it says that only 20 were retrieved because I cut it off before it retrieved all 49. But then I can browse through these titles and determine whether I want one, a few, or all of them, and then I can download them to a local file on my computer. 
If I'm working on a project with a known set of MARC records, it may be useful to add some kind of a code to those MARC records in advance of, of um, doing the Z3950 query so that you can go in and search perhaps a keyword. Um, let's say you have a code like um, a photo, either just something out of the air. Put that photo code in, in a, or it should be something unique. So maybe um, I'd use my initials, NJF photo and put that unique code into your mark in, in a, a local field in your mark record and then you can do a keyword search from this uh, market at C3950 client on NJF photo and it will retrieve all of those records in the catalog that have that code. So you can, you can pull up all of the records that will be used in your project in that way. The MarkEdit C3950 client outputs the result files in Mark21 format, so there need, you need to have another step here um, to get them into an XML format. You may find that other Z3950 clients can be programmed to output Mark records directly as Mark XML. If you're using MarkEdit, uh, MarkEdit also includes, as part of its software, a translation from Mark21 format to Mark XML. You can do this file by file, or you can do it in batch. I'm not going to run through um, the way to do that in using MarkEdit. I would refer you to Terry Reese's website, and in fact, we've, at the end of the uh, webinar, um, there's a link to that website in the resources. Oops. Well, I did actually include, my apologies, a screenshot um, of how to do this in, in MarkEdit. Um, I'll just run through it really, really quickly. Um, as you can see here in, in MarkEdit tools, there's a, um, a link or, or a choice to go from Mark to Mark 21 XML. Um, one of the other thing that I want to point out here is that there are you can also see that there are other options for turning MARC into other formats here. So this is a, a really, really, MARC Edit is a great tool. It's very, very useful. It's very easy to use. Um, Terry Reese has done a great job with this. Another, um, from the internet, I have had some experience with downloading um, XML files from the Internet Archive. Um, you may find that there is some kind of descriptive meta metadata for one or more of your digital objects on the web. Um, if you're lucky enough to find that there's some information in um, a, a website that happens to have XML files, um, then you can download those files. In this case, um, what I did here, um, as you can see in the bottom corner here, where it says all files, it's circled in red, all files, HTTP, if you click on that link, um, it will take you to an index that shows all of the background files that the Internet Archive stores for this object. And you can see that there are a, f a couple of XML files here. There's um, a Dublin Core XML file. There's a Mark XML file. There's a Meta XML file, which is kind of a, I believe it's kind of a mix of um, Internet Archives metadata along with some Mark XML metadata. So, you know, you can download these, you can play with them, you can see, you know, what's here that, that you think you can use, um, whether or not they need to be augmented. All of these files are free to download. Um, you just download them to your local computer and then you edit them or use them as you need. Data from a spreadsheet can also be extracted and turned into XML with the column headings translating to XML tags. This is a really, really simple uh, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that's created to capture title, author, publisher, publication date, and subject. And again, I've used the cat in the hat example. The column headings are very genetic, generic, and um, don't represent any kind of standard metadata scheme. So I made up some, some values for the cat in the hat, um, but as Marisa suggested earlier, you may have a spreadsheet like this with locally created column headings 
holding metadata for some collection of objects that you're now ready to digitize, such as you know, photographs. So wouldn't it be great if you could programmatically extract this metadata from the spreadsheet and then use it in your repository? Well, you can. This is a screenshot from the Oxygen XML editor. Um, Oxygen is not free, but it is a very useful tool if you're working with XML documents. One of Oxygen's features is the ability to import files in certain non-XML formats and translate them to XML. Oxygen will specifically translate Microsoft Excel spreadsheets into XML. So at the top of the page here, you can see that here's my, basically here's my spreadsheet. I've got my, my column headings, title, author, publisher, pub date, and subject, followed by the data that I created for the cat in the hat. I'm telling Oxygen here that the first row of my spreadsheet contains my field names, and then down below, it gives me a preview of the XML format that it will output for this spreadsheet. And what it's telling me here is that I have one row, and I, here I've got my envelope for the row, and it's outputting a tag for title, containing that title, title data from, the, from um, the cat in the hat, the author, the publisher, the pub date, and the subject. So if I had multiple um, fields here, if I had the cat in the hat and hop on pop and whatever other Dr. Seuss book you can think of, um, they would all show up in, uh, in envelopes, in these row envelopes, and all be part of, of um, your XML file. The last example I want to show you is extracting data from a database. So if you can extract metadata from a database as a tab delimited file, you should be able to drop it into Microsoft Excel and then translate it to XML um, using perhaps using Oxygen the way I just showed in the last slide. But some databases may have built-in tools that allow you to export the metadata directly in XML format. So this is a screenshot from Microsoft Access. In Access's export menu under More, as you can see here, we've got Export and More, um, you'll find um, an option to export metadata from the database in XML format. Access defaults to its own output version of XML based on the tables and fields in the database you're, you've created. However, Access also allows you to reference um, a local or custom-made XML transformation as part of your export process. So if you've written a transformation, and I'll talk more about transformation shortly, but if you've written a transformation from the Access XML format, let's say, to Dublin Core, you can tell Access to use that transformation every time it exports the metadata. So it will export the metadata from the database directly into your Dublin Core XML format. So just to reiterate, again, these are just a few examples of ways that metadata can be extracted from silo sources using you know, really common and, and widely used programs. So you know, I have no doubt that there are many more ways to do this, um, other programs that can be used. And I encourage you to you know, be creative and, and find them. Think outside the box and see you know, what you've got available and what you can do with it that you might not have thought about before. Okay, so on to the next step. So you've extracted the metadata from its siloed source, and you have it stored as a file in some kind of flavor of XML, but it's not necessarily the XML format that you need for your repository. So perhaps you have Mark XML, but you need Dublin Core. So going back, if you recall those repository metadata guidelines that, that I suggested you, know, you put in place before you even get started, well, this is where they come into play. You need to create a crosswalk between the XML you've, you've output from your from this, whatever system it is, from the, so the XML tags and your extracted metadata. You need to crosswalk those to the tags that you need in your repository metadata scheme. For example, if your repository requires a title field, 
Um, you have, let's say, the title in Mark XML, which shows up in Mark XML as Mark Data Field Tag equals 245. And um, you want to get it into Dublin Core, which will show up as DC Title. It's a little more complicated than just doing this title equals, mark tag equals, um, because mark data field 245 is actually comprised of a lot of subfields. And one of those subfields, um, namely subfield C, contains author data. You don't want the author information in your Dublin Core title field, so you have to figure out a way when you're doing this crosswalk to exclude some of the data that's in this title mark tag 245 from going into your DC title tag. Transforming the MARC XML data values into a Dublin Core XML format can be done using XSLT. XSLT stands for Extensible Style Sheet Language Transformations. It's a language for transforming XML documents into other XML documents. It looks pretty similar to HTML and XML. It's got the same kind of bracketed tagging. But rather than telling a computer how to display data stylistically, XSLT tells it how to reformat the data itself and how to output the data, the data itself. If you don't have someone in your systems department who's familiar with XSLT, um, it is really not that hard to learn. Um, I'm a librarian. I'm not a programmer. Um, but I actually taught myself to use XSLT using books and internet resources and playing around with um, an XSLT program that was written by another librarian. I taught myself to read it. I played around with it, made some adjustments, adjustments to it, saw what, what effect the adjustments I made had, and then eventually took that and, and just worked off of it and, and continued to learn and grow. On the other hand, you also don't necessarily need to write your own XSLT. Um, you've already seen that Mark Edit comes with some canned um, XSLT transformations. Um, the Library of Congress also has XSL transformations available. Um, if you go to its standards, uh, the standards pages on its website, on the on Library of Congress website, um, if you go to the um, uh, Mark XML or the MODS or, or perhaps even the EAD um, pages, XML pages, you will find some transformations, some XSLT transformations there. So just to give you an idea of how an XSL transformation works, um, or, or how, how easy it is, this is just a snippet of an XSL transformation to convert Mark XML to Dublin Core. And here's what this snippet says to do. This first XSL for each instruction is saying that every time the program finds or the, the XSLT finds um, the tag, mark data field at tag equals 245, it should create a DC title tag. In the previous slide, I showed how we mapped the mark 245 um, tag to that DC title. And that's what this is doing here. Um, but again, we also discussed that we don't want to map that mark data field subfield, that, that um, subfield C in the mark uh, 245 tag because that contains author information and we just want title information here. So the next two lines of instruction, this XSL value of select, is telling the program only to map the subfield mark um, two four, tag 245 subfield A, which is the main title, and subfield B, which is the subtitle, to the, into the double core title field. The next set of instructions, this next XSL for each select, is telling it to select, um, is telling it that every time the XSLT sees a marked data field tag 100, which is the main author, it should create a DC creator tag. And within this creator tag, it should take all of the values that are in the, um, this, this period stands, says to take all of the values that are in the mark um, 100 field. So it will concatenate all of those values. So to give you an idea of what this looks like when it's done, so here's your mark XML in, and so you've got a mark XML data field tag 100, this is your main title. 
and you've got a subfield code A, which has SUS, and you've got a code C, which has doctor. And if you recall, we said that um, in the previous slide, we said that you should take everything that's everything that's in that um, Mark 100 field and, and put it into DC Creator. And that's what we've done. We've got DC Creator, SUS, comma, doctor concatenated in that field. And back to the Mark XML, where we've got tag 245. Again, this is the title field. And if you'll recall, we said that it should select subfield A and subfield B because we only want those. We don't want any author information. So here's the Mark 245 subfield A, which has got the cat in the hat, and it's got a subfield C by Dr. Seuss. So we want to exclude that. And as you can see, it did. We've just got the cat in the hat in DC title, and we were able to exclude by Dr. Seuss. Also notice that um, in the Mark XML file, the, um, the author data, data, the 100 tag, precedes the 245 tag. But in our, our XSLT, we said that we wanted, um, we wanted the title first. We wanted first DC title and then DC creator. So when it output the Dublin core, it output in the order that we told it to process. So we've taken the heavily encoded and very complex looking Mark XML, we've taken just the data we wanted out of it, sorted it differently, um, and turned it into the Dublin Core format that we needed for our repository. And again, this is just an example. It's a very simple example. You can do things that are a lot more complex um, with, with XSLT, but this is just to give you an idea that, you know, you get it into XML, um, you can change it and you can make it and pretty much you can make it into what you want. There may be some limitations based on how the data is formatted in your original XML file, but you can really do a lot with it. You can really make a lot of changes and you can really format it and, and make it into what you want or what you need. So to sum up, um, the unfortunate fact that your descriptive metadata may be in isolated silos um, should not be an insurmountable barrier to reusing that metadata. Sure, it would be wonderful if um, everything was interoperable. Um, you know, it would be great, but unfortunately that's not our world. Um, but if you can extract or export metadata from silo sources, turn it into XML, you can transform it, you can add data to it, you can, in general, manipulate it into a form that you can use in your repository. So we hope that we've given you some ideas to build upon and inspired you to think creatively about the tools that you may have available at hand to facilitate extracting pre-existing metadata from other sources and then reusing that metadata in your institutional repository. Um, before we start taking questions, I just want to run through, we've actually given you a couple of slides of resources that we thought um, would be useful or, or interesting. Um, there's the um, DLF's best practices for sharing, for shareable metadata. Um, there are some, a, a couple of articles um, that I know Marissa found really useful um, talking about sharing metadata. And then there's the NISO Understanding Metadata site. Uh, web page. In the beginning of my, sec my session, I was talking about uh, creating metadata guidelines. I wanted to give you a couple of examples of metadata guidelines that are out there and encourage you to find others. Um, that you, you know, Google metadata, metadata um, best practices or metadata guidelines. Um, you should be able to find lots of these. Uh, Library of Congress's metadata for digital content went up pretty recently within the last few months, I believe. Um, the University of Maryland Descriptive Metadata Tag Library is very nicely laid out. Um, I believe that it, it actually uses, uh, may use University of Virginia Tag Library as its base, or, or, or that it, it draws some, some of its um, information from there. And then there's a recent article in the Journal of Library Metadata that talks about um, how um, Utah libraries went about um, creating best practices for a, consortium, for a consortium. And in, for XSLT, I also wanted to give you some links to um, let you take a look at XSLT and, and give yourself a chance to um, see if you can do it. 
sorry, um, the W3C school has, a, has an XSLT tutorial. Um, I tend to use a lot of books. Um, being a librarian, that makes sense. Um, Michael Kay is, is the XSLT guru, and um, I find his book very useful, but sometimes it's a little technical for beginners. Um, Jenny Tennyson has got beginning XSLT 2.0, um, which is a nice place to start. There are also some O'Reilly books on XSLT. Um, there's a beginning XSLT that may be for um, XSLT 1.0, but still I would recommend it as, um, as a place to start, an easy book to read and a nice place to start. Alex offers um, on occasion a pre-conference course on XSLT. It's called XSLT for Digital Libraries. I've taken the course and found it useful. They are offering it again at um, ALA in Washington. The Library of Congress, as I mentioned, has some XSLT pre, pre uh, or canned XSLT available on it, its website. Um, I'm also giving you a link to Mark Edit, and if you'd like to go take a look, if you don't already use it for the Oxygen XML editor. And finally, um, we're just pointing you to the page where Alex has its um, institutional repository resources, which are resources that are. Uh, um, have been um, mentioned in other webinars, uh, institutional repository webinars that Alexa has um, sponsored. So thank you. We hope that this has been useful for you and um, would appreciate if you have any questions. And uh, you can type them in. So this is Marisa, and um, I would encourage you to enter questions. There's a right-hand um, sidebar that you can enter your questions in the chat box. We'd be glad to take them. We definitely have some time. So, Nancy, we have a question. Um, how does Oxygen deal with repeatable fields? Um, repeatable fields? Um, I guess the question, I'm not sure what, what you mean. I suppose if, um, if you want to have, if, if you want to use Oxygen to, um, to transform um, repeatable fields, it will do that. You, you tell In your XSLT, you can tell it to output more than one instance of a particular tab. You can tell it, for example, every time it finds a subject uh, 650 tag in the MARC XML, that it should output, for each one, it should output a DC subject tag or whatever tag you, you choose to create. Okay. I hope that answers the question. We have another question. Uh, is XSLT somehow related to the extensible catalog? Um, I think that's, you're, you're talking about Rochester's extensible catalog, and to be honest, I don't know. Um, I expect that they use XSLT, but XSLT is actually part of, um, um, it's one piece of the of extens extensible style sheet language. There are, I think, three or four pieces of XSL. And if you go to that um, XSL um, W3 school tutorial, you will find information there about um, XSL in general, as well as the, this particular piece, XSLT, the transformation language piece of XSL. Okay. Um, we have another question. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this. Is National Library of Medicine using a repository, and what's the platform? Uh, yes, I can. The, the National Library of Medicine is currently um, piloting um, a digital repository. We're, we're just in the process of doing pilot projects. We um, are using Fedora. Okay. 
We have a question from a new librarian, and I can probably take this question. Um, this librarian asks, um, she works at a, or he works at a small li academic library with an ILS content DM, um, but no institutional repository. Could we suggest some sites to, for getting to know IRs? Um, we would certainly suggest that you um, take a look at the Alex um, resource link that we provided at the end of our presentation, because we have a lot of other presentations. Alex has offered other presentations on um, getting started with an institutional repository. Um, and if you want to contact me off-site um, or offline, I'd certainly be able to um, kind of take you through the steps of how we launched our, our IR, and um, I can give you some insight. Let's see. Uh, someone commented, I assume you really need a programmer to handle automated transfers from one database to another, but do you know of any tools that are useful? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose you would um, if you wanted it to happen, well, not necessarily, if you wanted it to happen seamlessly and automatically without anybody touching anything, then yes, you would probably need to have a programmer involved. However, you could set it up and then find a programmer to do it, uh, to, to make it I mean, the idea would be you set it up, have a programmer make it happen, make it so. Um, for example, I did do this at, um, at, in a previous position where we transferred metadata from an, the institutional repository. Um, we took the metadata from the institutional repository. How do we start here? We put metadata, we put Mark XML records and Dublin Core records into the institutional repository. Um, within the, then we, we had the repository actually spit out the Mark XML records. They were sent to me, and a programmer did set this up, they were sent to me as an RSS feed on a weekly basis. And um, I then used, created an XSLT script that translated or, or, or took those, those book Mark XML records and turn them into records for electronic resources, which we then um, batch loaded into our ILS. So yeah, if you want to have it happen seamlessly, it would have been really nice to have a programmer set that up so that um, I didn't have to get the RSS feed, that it would automatically, those records would get exported from, from the repository the XSLT would automatically work on them and then they would automatically get ingested, you know, into back into the ILS. But it can be done. Okay. Another question. Um, we have a ProQuest metadata for dissertations now in um, Dublin Core in our institutional repository. We also have a brief mark, we also have brief mark records in our catalog that include unique local elements such as department name. So each existing record form has unique elements. How would you approach upgrading the IR records, if at all? Um, the IR records, let me see if I've got this straight. The IR records are in Dublin Core, and you want to update them with information from the MARC record. That's what it sounds like, yes. Yeah. Um, gosh, you know, you can, um, if your MARC records contain the same information that's in your Dublin Core, that's in your institution or repository, um, if your repository has some kind of disseminator where it can go out and harvest from your ILS, you could harvest those records from your ILS, create an, XSL, um, an XSLT program to get them into um, the Dublin Core to turn those, those that Mark XML, export it from your ILS, turn it into Mark XML, get Dublin, um, get, write an XSLT to translate it, to transform it to Dublin Core, and then um, overwrite your records in your repository. It really depends on your repository architecture on how complex that can be. Um, something that we haven't tried, but that um, has been discussed with one institutional repository that I worked with, is using um, using a disseminator um, for the um, repository platform to um, grab updates 
to mark records in the ILS and to then pull those updates um, into the IR. The, the IR has um, in it, um, uh, had in it a program that would, um, that would change the mark XML to Dublin Core. So it, so it was set up so that it could be done automatically. Okay, we have another question. Uh, regarding programmers, don't most ILS systems have harvesting programs to ingest data from IRs using um, the standard OAI PMH? Um, I don't know. I know for, for us, our institutional repository certainly um, has a, is OAI PMH, uh, it operates on that standard. It's just a matter of um, if the metadata is um, imported into the ILS in a stream, it would be, we would have to have obviously kind of an intermediary step where someone takes a look at it and transforms it because for students, for example, we'd love to just get that IR metadata right into our ILS, but some transformations need to happen in terms of verifying the metadata and uh, making sure that it conforms to our standards, that it, it appears correctly. Uh, another question: um, Have you had experiences to have you had experiences with extracting metadata from an ILS and importing it into an institutional repositories? Um, the only experience that I've had with that has been where the scanner is um, the scanning is part of the digitization process. The scanner is well. The scanner is, is pulling um, mark records from the ILS and um, outputting them in multiple formats of XML, uh, mark XML, double core mods. Although actually I was recently involved in a project where we went in and used E3950 to pull the records out of the ILS as mark, XML, as mark records, turn them into mark XML, and then um, we used that, those mark XML records um, we ingested them into the repository and also created other XML formats from them and, and deposited those, ingested those into the repository as well. Okay. So, so yeah, Z3950, to get the records out of the ILS, you'd, you'd use a Z3950 client. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, are there metadata standards or even best practices for associating user-generated metadata with a digital object? I'm not aware of any standards for user-generated metadata. Um, are you, Nancy? No, I'm not either. I, I think a lot of systems, I suspect that a lot of systems that take user-generated metadata are using Dublin Core um, because it's very simple. And that's originally what you know, Dublin Core was created for, was for, for users or authors to be able to input um, their own metadata. So, um, but are there best practices for it? I, not that I'm aware of. Okay, so I guess we're gonna hand it off to you, Cindy. Okay, good. Let me show my screen here. And okay, um, I want to thank Marisa and Nancy for the very thorough and practical overview of IR metadata practices and challenges. And I want to thank the audience. We've never had so many good questions before. We really appreciate your attention. Um, I want to tell you that the Alex office will be sending registrants, those of you who registered, a link for today's webinar presentation and an evaluation form. Pamela Blue and I urge you to fill out the evaluation form because we do review them and appreciate all your comments and ideas. Um, Pamela and I also hope that you will join us again on April 7th for the next webinar in the IR series, which is Selecting an IR Platform. The presenter will be Bob Garrity, Associate University Librarian for Systems and Information Technology for the Boston College Libraries. You can see we also have um, presentations scheduled for April 28th and May 19th. 
Finally, additional presentations in the IR series as well as the Lex webinars and other topics are featured on the Lex homepage. New webinars and CE events are continuously being developed, so check the IR or the Alex homepage frequently for new information. If you have ideas for webinars or other continuing education opportunities for Alex, please contact either Pamela or me at the e addresses listed on the slide. Again, we appreciate all of you coming today, and we hope we'll see you again at one of the future webinars.